White Centipede Noise podcast is made possible by your support via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to support and stay tuned to hear about the exclusive benefits and bonus content available with this episode. Welcome to a very special episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast. I'm here in Minneapolis with two members of the band Burning. And this is a band I was deeply involved with when I lived here. And they have continued on and 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 grown and grown and grown and grown the entire time. Um, especially since I've been gone. It's really special for me to be able to be with them. Um, Sadie's my best friend, and we've been very close for many, many years. So this, to me, is a real pleasure and honor and also a chance to kind of even learn something about this band that I used to be a member of that has been doing so many amazing things lately that I don't even know as much about as I would like to. So without further ado, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves just so um, I don't fuck it up. Um, Sadie, I'm gonna start with you. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Sadie Ryan, and this is my partner and bandmate, Adam Kolova. Uh, we're missing two members, uh, Mike Filkins, who is our drummer, and has been the drummer in Burning since day one. Yep. Um, and we're also missing Colin Wyland, um, who is a solo electronic, like mutant techno and modular synth artist um, that joined our band about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and we have kind of a sort of fifth, secret fifth member, um, which is Tanner Anderson. Um, who now lives in Boston and has his own project of Sequiae and is also a member of Panopticon um, and is a very, very, very busy individual, but has helped us um, in the meantime since he's moved to Boston even a little bit with mm -hmm. recordings and just kind of general insight and vibe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I always have described Burning as an industrial band, but really, that's, I, th I think at this point, pretty reductive or, or at least a, a very misleading small sliver of the picture. What do you I describe burning as these days? I don't know if I think it's reductive. Um, I think, I obviously, I think very highly of industrial music as a genre for the most part. Um, but I think that we're, we're just industrial adjacent at all times, just kind of like orbiting whatever that is. And I think that when you know, you're talking to like the audience that is going to be viewing this, or you you know, pe the people that watch your podcast probably have a very different I idea of what industrial music is, rather than like a crowd that would be like a dance club, right. like goth crowd. That term itself is so uh, subjective. Right, exactly. More, yeah. more than like many genres. More than most genres, yeah. for sure. But, you know, if you have many millions of people or whatever, like defining EBM as industrial, like it's out of your control at that point. Right. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, I, I also think that in some ways, like even if we aren't technically an industrial band, cause we borrow so much from like prog rock and noise rock and stuff like that, um, that if anything, we're, we're kind of like a Swiss army knife of industrial music. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I've been saying that since you were in the band, mm -hmm. um, 
and that still holds true, like covering everything from EBM to like neo folk kind of shit to like noisy kind of whatever, you know, death industrial kind of stuff. I th I think I've talked about it at least a couple times in the podcast, kind of starting the project with you. And I have my own kind of memory of those times, um, but tell me about that from your memory. <coughs> the timeline, like the focus, like what, like, because I, I remember going into it thinking we were starting a noise project. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think that's been, that for, for the time I was in the band, that was always kind of like the push and pull. And, and I was like, we're doing a noise project. <laughs> Harsh noise, maybe was, a little bit more like a little bit more throbbing than I'm used to. Sure. And at some point, that changed. I mean, that I realized this is changing a lot, and I then I started just kind of following right. your lead because you were going in a totally different, uh, unique direction. So, can you just tell me what? How did how did we start the band? I mean, how did you meet me? CDs out now on Satatuwata, Violent Shogun, Peace, Impact, Burnout, and the new boyfriend, Universal Noise. Bundle deal available at satatuwata.net. Tatuata is an EU-based label and distribution for harsh noise, industrial, and experimental sounds. The online distro is located at satatuata.net, providing regular updates of new releases and offering worldwide shipping. That's satatuata, S-A-T-A-T-U-H-A-T-T-A, dot -A -A -T -T net. Well, I, I met you like years prior to us starting, like ultimately, like right. I remember seeing you perform in, you know, like the cockpit house, which was a kind of shit, shitty, like crusty house on in the U of M campus area. But I think that the genesis of Bernie is it, it's just ridiculous. It's <laughs> it's kind of funny if I if my memory serves correct. Um, I think it was. <clears throat> My understanding that it was gonna be more of like a like a power electronics project, but not in a White House fashion or you know, and like it, it to me I think not the way old you, school, old school, but like more no. on like the like like the the more wild side of SPK. Okay. Yeah. yeah you yeah, know, yeah. like that's how I understood it. Yeah. Um, and especially because I remember going over to your house after you got the SPK box set <laughs> and listening to those records. And I remember thinking, like, this is what we're doing. This yeah. is what we're going to do. Yeah. And um, so in my mind, it was like we were just doing primitive industrial, mm -hmm. like real, true, classic industrial. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I never thought of it as like a, like a true noise. Right, right. No, we, 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 we define it as, like, raw industrial. Right. But, I mean... And initially it was. Yeah, initially it was. I mean, some of those first shows... Do you remember our first show? At Nick and Eddie? No, it was at Medusa. Wow. Um, I woke up at, like, 10.30 after I had been, like... I went to this, like, insane, like, bottle share, beer trade bullshit thing and, like, had, like... 22 fucking imperial stouts and like woke up at like midnight or something and lucy was like hey don't you have a show tonight and i was like oh fuck yeah i, I totally do and i showed up at medusa like like drunk and very fucking dusty and you're like hey what's going on we're like gonna play soon <laughs> you don't remember that it was like in the middle of july or something because it was like super humid in there it was like soaking wet in the venue, yeah. and like we played at like three in the morning, and just like it was really raw. Yeah, there's video. There, I know there's video of it somewhere. That, at the PV amp. Yeah. Probably that stovetop. Exactly. And that's about it. Uh huh. And I had a bunch of like circuit panel electronics. Like, yeah. None of that shit has yeah. lasted the like time. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. I remember the first few shows being like that. And then at some point, <coughs> when did it sh at some point you really started writing, well, you started bringing in tracks, which I was first kind of against. Like you started bringing these backing tracks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, it's against the whole idea. It's against the law. Yeah, like yeah. we're supposed to be playing, whatever it is, we're supposed to be playing it. Um, and but then you really just kept going with that, and then I realized the, the the tracks you were bringing weren't like just some loops and some clanging banging stuff. They had this really kind of even then hints of like really interesting melodies and rhythms and like melancholic, weird weird Weirdness. music. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and and. And at some point, yeah, I was like, okay, I, I, I guess I accept, I accept this because it's good. It's really just good. It's really, it's, it's not what I th thought this was going to be at all, <laughs> but it's something totally different. And now it's, it's, it's uh, actually good. So, wh when did you start reaching towards that? Like, well, I mean, this follows that ridiculousness. Like, I had, was at Medusa one night, and my friend Christian was like, hey, I want to start a Nine Inch Nails cover band for Halloween, and I was like. Okay, sure. And he was like, "Do you want to play guitar?" And I was like, "Yeah, I can play guitar for that. That's easy, yeah. you know." Um, and then we got Mike on board drum. Um, but the hangup was <clears throat> Christian proposed the impossible, and he was like, "We need to cover closer." And I was like, "We can't." And he was like, "Why not?" And I'm like, "Because that song has like 40 layers of synthesizers, and like that's kind of it, yeah. you know." And he was like, we can totally do it. And I'm like, no, we can't. And it forced me to learn how to program, um, which is like the dumbest way to tell the story, but it's, it's the honest truth. Like, I remember that, that's true. <clears throat> um, so I had to create those like backing tracks for Nine Inch Nails. And I mean, it's just so funny to say that in the context of Burning, because I, I think when people think of Burning, they're like, you're the proggiest fucking industrial band I've ever heard. Like, this is like very much in that territory yeah. of like, you know, Nine Inch Nails bullshit. Um, and so, yeah, like, we had to do that. And then it was great because, like, it learned me how... It re forced me to learn how to, like, like really, really program. Like, I had already understood music theory pretty well from being in death metal bands in high school and stuff like that. Um, so that wasn't the issue. It was just, like, I had never, like, looked at a grid like that. And, like, yeah. you know... And you took to it? like you. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, I was, like, fucking A. This is so, like... Awesome. What did you like about it? Um, tough to say. I don't know. It just gelled. It felt very organic. It felt like something I should be doing. And maybe that's one of those like biases, you know, like when you really, really just, when you already like kind of objectively love something and something kind of like auxiliary and difficult is attached to it, you just don't mind. You, you take to it because you're kind of like, well, whatever, that's worth the sacrifice because I fucking love this so much. Yeah. And I think it just like completely like went over the, it just over arced into my childhood because I grew up in the 90s, like listening to ministry and filter and all the like big, like, you know, the big, big acts that came FDM kind of stuff that was like thriving in the mid 90s. Yeah. Um, before I got into like extreme metal, that, that was like, that's what affected me when I was a little kid and like affected me like, deeply obvious like yeah bringing sequencing and um like multi-track synths into our domain seemed very organic especially considering that like th like the bands that we were initially emulating like spk and stuff like eventually did the same thing anyway mm -hmm. you know what i mean like not that we were like doing we were gonna do like a metal dance sort of situation but um and, like, when you listen back to that earlier stuff that was, like, sequenced since, it's not, I wouldn't even call that, I wouldn't call it EBM. It was right. It was a lot weirder. It was a right. lot more dreamlike and surreal. Very much so. And, I mean, a lot of it was, like, you couldn't find the, I think that's been an interesting thing as the music went on, and we really accepted that it was, okay, rhythmic and, and very rhythmic, and Mike was drumming, and I was doing percussion. I mean, even finding the one... Yeah, on the, when, you'd, when you'd bring a new track to us, <laughs> that's my favorite trick. It would be like, 
all right, this sounds great. And then we'd both try to start playing with it and start figuring it out. And we'd, you know, Mike and I and you would all have three different kind of impressions of where the one <laughs> is or where the, you know, or what, what, <laughs> but what time signature it's in. Since I programmed it, I actually tech, I knew where the one yeah. was. Yeah, but it was always in some weird yeah. spot that it wasn't, you know, didn't sound like it was. But that's a trick. It's called hide the one. Yeah. And like, you, what you do is you take a melody that resolves and you put the one in a part that is not on the resolution of the melody. And it fucks with your brain so much, especially if you're writing in odd meters. It, it like really, it's, it's a wonderful trick. I don't do it to Mike anymore because he hates it so much. <laughs> so like none of the newer printing material has the hide the one trick, but yeah. it sounds good. How was it for you, as we as the band progressed, like dealing with my push or my interests or my influence or what? I, you know, did you ever f feel like you wanted to pull me in a different direction or I was pulling in a certain direction too much or didn't get it? Not at all. Really? I loved it. Okay. Yep. I thought it was great. I liked how much like you were like going really, really hard into like noise cassette culture and stuff like that. Like you, you were really, really into like the culture side of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I had nothing but respect and love mm -hmm. for that. I mm -hmm. thought it was really cool. Did you ever find it was like, but in terms of like playing the music or, or you know, collaborating on the music that there was uh, I don't think, like things I, that- No, I don't think gel? it ever gave you a disadvantage. No. And not, not at all. Cause yeah. I mean like, <clears throat> burning is still largely about texture. At the end of the day, like mm -hmm. despite all of the, like the like nerdy music theory shit, like it's 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 very t textural, like tactile. You like you you can touch it, and I think that like if anybody that's into noise music enjoys burning, it's for that reason. Right. You know, it's because it is so highly, highly, highly textured. Um, and like I've never been drawn to synths that are just like like if you listen to like standard like dark wave stuff, like I have zero absolutely zero fucking interest in that stuff. None, none at all. Yeah. And and a part of that is because it is just kind of like four, four on the floor arpeggiations with like the most boring ass like square wave synth kind of stuff. And it's great if you love that, whatever. Like I'm like, I shouldn't sound like such an ass about this, but <clears throat> like, I don't know. It just it doesn't appeal to me because like, I think f even from like an early age, like what drew me to music in the first place, what made me want to make music is, well, there's two reasons. One is, one was texture. Like I really wanted to, like I remember hearing when I was, when I was young, when I was a teen, um, Ministry released their Filth Big album, like in real time in my life at that, mm -hmm. at that point. And I remember hearing the first track on there and it sounded like um, the cymbals were replaced with broken glass. I don't know what the sample is, Right. Um, I, I don't, I don't know, but either way, it, it sounded like this like crashing, glassy kind of sound, and I was so drawn to that. I, I just, it felt like, I, 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 I don't know. I really wanted to do that, 
Um, and then, and then there was just like a, a fundamental need to make music, mm -hmm. like something that was that existed beyond me. Yeah. You know, like a, like a demon muse sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, <clears throat> like I didn't get a vote on it. Right. If that makes sense. Right. And you know, you are, you always have been, someone who works, on music. Like, tirelessly. I mean, like, late nights every night, when you can, but you make time for it, you know. And. Um, I guess I want to get back to that, but talking a little bit more about the, the synths and stuff like that, that was something I think was interesting is you really were drawn towards modern sounds and or I, I got the sense you're drawn towards modern sounds and like not that impressed with like the whole analog synth worship and sound. And that was kind of like my only entry point maybe to synths was like, you know, MS-20 or that kind of, you know, like, I mean, even even stuff is like far removed from what maybe ministry is like, you know, just like Tesco stuff, genocide organ, like that. Right. But but you were always really focused on clean, like modern, like <coughs> those <coughs> those types of sounds. Um, like I would uh, like me yeah, like full spectrum. Yeah. Sure. Like full audio spectrum. Yeah. Um. But no, I wouldn't call those synths clean at all. Like they're very like coarse and disgusting. Right, you right, know, right, right. But I mean, yeah, you're right. Full, but full spectrum. Full spectrum. Yeah. Not lo-fi. Like lo-fi right. was not the, the goal. And, and I just think there's something so. I'm really, really eager. For your, new albums to come out. I mean, I the stuff you showed me just now. And the stuff I've always, I mean, the stuff I've always been a part of and, and seen has always just been like, oh my God, this is so, this is so different. This is so advanced and obscure and unique. Like just the, the glassiness, the, the, the production quality, but also the, the songwriting and the, and the melodies. And that's something, um, I mean, where did your love of melody come from? Because that's something you've always really been focused on once it got to that point where the melody, and not just any melody, like you had kind of a lot of rules about melodies and things you liked and didn't like. Oh, totally. Um, I, I'm, I still obsess over melodies. And that's why like, I spend the majority of my time like, <clears throat> I feel like unlike a lot of people that I surround, or that I know, like a lot of our friend group and stuff like that, I don't, I'm not like, like sure, like if like there's a, like a Cherry Point reissue, I'll check it out eventually, but I'm not in any fucking hurry to right. listen to that. You know right. what I mean? Like, not saying there's anything wrong with that. That's great. I love that shit. I love like my friends that, that do and expose me to it and like bless their hearts for actually like taking the time to be like, you need to hear this. Mm -hmm. I just curated the best of the last hundred albums I heard. Yeah. So you you can, I've, I've filtered this. Yeah. I pre-chewed this food yeah, for you. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> it's, it's, and that's, that's awesome because I'm too busy listening to fucking the Beatles or something like that yeah. or whatever. And that's dumb. It's like, a, it's, but it, it, it's just like my brain. Yeah. Like I, like I, I love to like just sit around and analyze like hooks and counter melodies and you know what I mean? Chord progressions like mm -hmm. that. I, I, there, I'm super drawn to it, and I, I don't know. Like, I think that that magnetism is is a byproduct of despair. You know, like I think it, it's just like an ancient despair that's been with me since I was a kid, and I think that, <clears throat> hence, like the melancholic chord progressions that kind of surface to the top of even like our most like polyrhythmic and chuggy, genty fucking tracks, like, still have that, like, you know, that well of sadness that comes through the, the chords and the, and the melodies. Tell me about some of the lyrical themes um, at the center of Burning and also how they might have changed over time. And <clears throat> the funny thing is they haven't. They haven't changed at all. Like, <clears throat> um, 
So you and I and I had a band prior to Burning that I don't consider to be the same band. And it, it, I find it, I, it's actually kind of frustrating when people are like, oh, like when your band used to be called. Yeah. Like I, those two things are so distinctly different in my mind. Yeah. Um, and not just because of like the band member changes, like <clears throat> adding Brandon and Mike and stuff right. like that and like just whatever. Um, and the aesthetic changes, but like just like the like the spirit of it was objectively different. Mm-hmm. Um, so our, our first band was called Prostate, which you <laughs> came up with the name <laughs> with. Um, I famously hated, um, and um, that was that was a, an experimental, like a, a demoing. Um, embryonic it was just like a it was it was a platform to experiment and and which was good that's great i'm yeah. glad we did it yeah. um but burning didn't feel like that as much and it felt a, lo- a lot more focused and it had like a sense of urgency and it, uh, definitely a sense of intensity right um that <clears throat> and i was being a lot more honest in burning yeah. you know i think that's when i realized okay this is your band and this is something I'm just here like I'm along for the ride here I think in the early maybe year or so or whatever I don't know I was still like I don't know like what's maybe we should do a little more of this maybe we should do a little more of that and at some point yeah, I think when it was like okay this is burning now I was like all right I'm on board with this and I, I see that I got, your vision was was clear and you were also more upfront about your vision you know like not that you like didn't allow me to contribute or be part of it but it was like you, you kind of like really led, led at that point. And I was like ready to be like, okay, yeah. Sure. That's the, that's the path. Yeah. I value honesty a lot. And I, I value like incredibly naked art and like, like visceral intensity. Um, and that's, that's exactly what I not only wanted, but like really, really object. I needed it. Mm-hmm. Like, um, because it was the only only outlet in my life, like at that juncture to to scream to the universe about who I was, what I was going through, yeah. um, and just like tell the truth, yeah. you know, in in a world that I felt constantly obligated to perform for in a way that satisfied mm-hmm. everyone except for me. Yeah. Can you be more specific about? Like the lyrical content and the themes. Well, I mean, it's like I said, it's always been about the same shit. It's always about um, just the, the standard queer issues of my life. The you know, like uh, being a trans person and um, just the sheer despair that comes with that. Like the monolith of crushing fucking anxiety and and depression that is a result of just kind of like. Um, being at odds with society constantly every single fucking day of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, constant, constant, constant. <clears throat> um, so, you know, it needs an outlet. And and then politics. Um, and I think that's one thing that still to this day, like largely, largely, even more so, separates Burning from a lot of other bands. It's like we don't, and we don't really have that, the luxury of that like camaraderie with a scene or something like that where and not just, I mean, of course, we've separated ourselves sonically to some degree, you know, like we exist in a very liminal space and some of that's intentional. Um, so, I like, yeah, but at the same time, um, I don't feel like it, I'm allowed that luxury to like think about like what, what releases are coming out on what labels and like, the, you know, the cool fucking packaging that something, you know what I mean? Like, I remember, I vividly remember having conversations or overhearing conversations you know, in days past of or old shows where people are just like, oh, like, did you see the, like, new blah, 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 seven inches came out and fucking whatever, and you know what I mean? Like, talking about distros and stuff, like, that's great. Love it. It's awesome. But I don't, that's not a part of my life. Yeah. The, narr- the, the narrative of my life is so radically different. Like, I'm sitting around here thinking about fucking... Red Caesar and Project 2025 and um, a looming authoritarian theocracy 
right. you know, like that's the, that's what's occupying my mental space. Right. It's what's occupying his mental space. Right. It's you know, like, and that's what burning comes from. It, it you know, like we're not we're not like a buddy band. Right. We're not a band to be a band. We're right. not a band to like play with your fucking homies. Like that's that and there's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. That's great. But it sure sounds nice. Right. It sounds really fucking cozy. Right. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that might sound like pretentious and stupid. It is. Know. But no. Um, <clears throat> you know, when, when Burning began, you hadn't come out yet. You, you say this was, the, this was the theme from the beginning. Were you conscious of this at the time? <clears throat> yeah. Um, it wasn't in all of our songs. Uh, like on our first album, the only song that's really about that is Black Dolphin, mm -hmm. like which I think opens the album perfectly. Yeah. You know, um, but like, there's another song on there about like my mom. Like I grew up like going. She has chronic Crohn's. Um, like bad. She's like the if Crohn's is a spectrum, she's on the deep deep end of that, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And um, she's like my hero, my best friend. Um, I mean, you're my best friend, but you know, you know what I mean. Right. Um. And, like, just growing up and always being in the hospital environment as a kid. Um, and so, like, there's a couple tracks on that album that kind of, like, use hospital sounds and, yeah. like, emulate that, that environment. Um, and then, you know, some of the other songs are about other things, like, I don't know, whatever. It, but it's all political. Right. Like, it's all, like, it's... <clears throat> You know, and like the newer burning stuff, same thing. Like it's, it's usually me screaming about people that really insist that there should be a hierarchy in society. You know, like I, or people that absolutely insist that people are objectively or mm, fundamentally good and bad. Right. And I, I hate that. I think that every human being is capable, equally capable of both. And I will die on that hill. But unfortunately, there is one half of our political system enables people that believe that people are either good or bad, and the label is the truth and the universal truth. Right. End of story. Yeah. So no matter what fucking shit they do, it doesn't matter because they're a good person. Right. And I, that eats, eats me. It, like, really, really eats me. It, like, ugh. So, yeah, um... A lot of burning stuff is is just about those about those kind of themes. Um, it's <clears throat> and then some of it is a little bit more surreal, um, not quite as surreal as the early early stuff. But you know, there's a lot of uh, explorations of like the other, mm -hmm. like you know, um, the weirding of the universe. Mm -hmm. Burning has remained, up till now at least, very low profile. I mean, it's like, in Minneapolis, it's like a great, well-kept secret and is loved and, and supported, but, um, you know, you're not really on social media. There's really no music to be found online. Correct. And performances are kind of the best way to see you. Um, with the, you know, with both the personal content and the political content of the music, is that something you want to change or see happening? I mean, is, for example, the political content, is that, do you have a goal of, of reaching people with that? Or is that for kind of self, um, I don't know, self-processing of, of these, these horrible things. It's definitely for self-processing, for sure. <clears throat> and I think I got used to that pretty quickly, like, you know, on, like on our first album on Silver After Death. With a song like Black Dolphin, um, I know that the lyrics kind of obscure things enough because I used Russian prison as a metaphor you know like one of the most extreme prisons on on the planet as a metaphor for what i was going f through um which there's some irony too because i feel like i just 
ultimately transferred prisons in my adult life. Um, sure, coming there's a lot of freedom in coming out, and I'm glad I did ultimately. But at the end of the day, like it's still a, a prison transfer yeah. due to <clears throat> the outside world and and right. you know just not being able to do anything. Yeah. Like, has life gotten harder or oh, easier? Easy. Like, well, it depends. Like externally, yes, 100. percent It's it's gotten a thousand times harder than I. Like I knew that there was like this like disdain in our, in our society for femininity. There's there's just like this like deep deep, like profound shame that people have when it comes to the expression of femininity, and it's it's horrible. Um, and people love to police where they think it belongs, like. Heavier set women aren't allowed to have it. Older women aren't allowed to have it. Women that don't meet certain beauty standards aren't allowed to have it. And it's amazing how much policing happens there. Gay men are not allowed to have it, so on and so forth. A trans woman, God, like, forbid. Like, and, you know, of all the brain conditions and brain abnormalities, we have this intensely complex computer in our, in our body, this, you know, this godlike organ and of all the abnormalities i find it laughable and challenging that people can't imagine that gender dysphoria would not be one of those very obvious abnormalities does that make sense of course like it has to be one of the most like like if if, if i were a god and you were a god and you were like we're going to design a new a new chess set um, to worship us as deities. And we were like, what are their imperfections going to be? Um, not to say that trans people are imperfect or something like that or queer people, but you know, it, it would just seem like such a fucking no brainer to be like, when we're designing this, the, the sexes, quote unquote, we're gonna make an intersex, number one. So not only is there not like two clear genders all the time, there, there is going to be a physical, like, third variable and six different chromosome sets to choose from to mm -hmm. make it even more complicated. Mm -hmm. And people in this country have no fucking room for nuance. Most people in the world don't have room for nuance. Yeah. Like, there's no patience for nuance. Yeah. People ex expect a very immediate black and white, yes or no, simple, simple, simple cells, simple as everything. People love simplicity to a worrying fault and just the, the lack of patience for a grayscale is is a part of this equation, you know? Um, and the lack of patience for liminality is also a part of this. Um, you know, like I'm not, even even in, in the sense that I am a, a queer person, a trans femme person, like I still have a lot of things that sit outside of that box, right. you know, like I, I still live in a very liminal space. There are things, there are old holdovers from, you know, uh, uh, a socialization as a young boy that I still love. Yeah. Like, and I have, I don't want to get rid of. Yeah. Like my love for like extreme heavy music is yeah. one of those things. Sure. However, like I loved being a little arty bitch when I was a kid. Like that, I loved it. I hated sports. I yeah. didn't like a lot of those things. I don't like hanging out in extremely gendered spaces to this day. Yeah. Like I don't like, <clears throat> you know, like yeah. you don't, I don't want to hang out in like women's spaces. I don't want to hang out in men's spaces. Right. I think those spaces are largely garbage because all they do is just in, like, they entice people to enforce like the worst parts of toxic masculinity and femininity, yeah. you know, and like these like fucking arbitrary and weird weird awkward gender norms that people are just so hung up on yeah. and there's just again so much shame so much shame right. and fear that comes with that shame and like you can see people's weird sexual oppression just a repression i should say just oozing out of it yeah. like just you're just like like i love it when people are like oh you did this as a sex thing you changed your life as a sex thing and i'm like well i wear my sex on my sleeve like so that you can't take that narrative from me. Yeah. Like, make it very clear that I like BDSM, like yeah. front and center, so yeah. that we don't even have to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, but 
at the same time, like, I'm like, are you sure it's me or is it you? Right. You know what I mean? Like, you're the one looking at me like you either want to fuck me or murder me. Right. So I think I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, anyhow. What is, I mean, what is daily life like? Uh, it's, it's very similar to what I was saying. It's, it's, it's just, like, impossibly liminal. It's, it's, like, I love being able to hang out with Adam and, like, work on music and, like, I make leather stuff and BDSM gear and, you know, like, I love cooking and I love being at home and working on our projects. Like, it's great. I love it. Um, I have a very rich life with my friend group and a social support system that like I don't take for granted at all um, and I deeply cherish I feel incredibly fortunate to have the friends that I have um, <coughs> but the outside world is a different thing and that isn't it's it's something I largely avoid um, which is unfortunate but it's I'm very much blessed that I came pre-programmed with a, a very rich interior world mm -hmm. Um, and I'm very, very happy about that. I'm very happy that, like, I can sustain a lot on, on just creating things. Are there things from your, you know, previously socialized gender that you are able to still call upon in constructive or or not as much as you'd think or or you know protective or whatever ways not as much as you'd think like I, I think that's another thing a lot of people don't understand is like when you change the gasoline type in a vehicle you know from like gas to diesel it's you're, you're dealing with like a different a different system on um, that's a horrible analogy but Whatever, we'll use it. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, and, you know, like, uh, testosterone-dominant brains are, like, as I have told you before, far more confident than I think they realize. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, an estrogenic mind, you acquire a new skill, as my mom and I have joked about before, and, and many of my other friends that are women and stuff, um, you get the fear quote unquote and it it's intense um so no you don't you don't just get to like you know yeah be a badass like like you kind of wish you could right you know that's <clears throat> that's well, sort of a relic of the past i don't i mean i still see that in you in many many ways and i obviously see that when you are on stage and perform how is how has that changed or stayed the same in terms i mean it's still the same i understand that you you are more you know interior these days and i totally understand why and i, I but, but yeah. i mean when you well is that part of a reason why you know burning has maintained quite a low profile uh, yeah yes and no um burning's always had a low profile and i've yeah. always i've always kind of enjoyed it um it's a double-edged sword i uh, i've certainly entertained the idea of uh, expanding or you know like playing the game a little bit and like jumping into that world where some of our other friends exist um and i have certainly had plenty of conversations with people that exist in that world that want uh, you to that want us to like, and, and what that looks like and i mean i i mean, we, we talked about this a few days ago I mean, Adam, too, like, you guys are such an incredible band that I think the world is just missing you guys so hard. And it's like, if, if, if the world could only really see you and hear you and know you, I mean, not just, I mean, the whole everything about it is so intense and important and, and there's nothing like it. And I feel like, gosh, that's so, that's so crazy that it's so... It's like just for you and, and, and for, you know, the handful of people that ha are privy to that, you know? Yeah, yeah we're I, I, I really want to see that change. I really, really want to see that change. <laughs> we'll see. I don't think that I have a lot of time. Yeah. You know? Um, so, and maybe that is the impetus. I've 
obviously been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, and then in lieu of everything that can change uh, 12 months, or not quite 14 months from now, um, which is constantly on my mind. Yeah. Like it's just hammering in the yeah. back of my mind. Um, yeah. Like what a what a theocracy looks like. What yeah. like it, that's something that like I don't hear other people talking about. And it, it makes me feel like an insane person, like yeah. or it makes me feel like a, a sane person amongst a lot of insane people. Yeah. Um. Like this this system that we have here, um. We just have done such a great job of taking for granted on um, in recent years just anticipating that things will be fine it just be fine like just a breeze and everything will right we'll just skate through the fucking get the, better and right the, yeah and i just i'm not seeing it i'm 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 really having a very difficult time seeing what other people are seeing in that yeah. um and you're watching very closely i do yeah i mean like he knows like i sit around and listen to politics all day like constantly and maybe it's not great for my my brain I, it might not be it might be terrible but at the same time like i want to know i want to know what these people are doing i want to know what the fucking heritage foundation's up to yeah. like it it that's really important to me yeah um and and it, it informs us too like do we need to be in you know amsterdam um when you know before january 6 of 2024 five right. or whatever or what yeah right 2025 um like and just be like oops we're already here too bad sorry right. like like those are that's yeah uh i don't sure. know um sorry what was the question um well i guess i don't original question i'm not sure but going like forward towards like your performance and how you, oh, I sure. mean, you know, you're fearless on stage. You always have been. Mm -hmm. And I saw you play a couple weeks ago here in town and you were fearless again. Is that, is that harder or is that the same that's always been or how, Same. How, same? Yeah. And then th that just comes from me trying to give my oppression to you. You know what I mean? That's that's what it's always been, and probably what it will always be, is just. This is what I'm surrounded by. Um, this is the brick wall that's closing in on me. And. These are people's expectations of me. This is what they feel they need from me. What they require in order to be. In you know, convenienced mm -hmm. um, at best, and I'm gonna give that to you. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna like, and that's in in Burning's music. I I tried my best to emulate the, the it's specifically that that yeah. that that deep, large black cloud of of weight of you know it's, it's a slab it's a slab of shame and disgust and fear and i want i want people to feel that weight the the heaviest weighted blanket of all time why catharsis <laughs> <laughs> i don't know like because I, I i want people to get it i want people yeah. to see it yeah i want people to actually see me it, you know what i mean yeah. like really truly yeah. see what what this is yeah sorry love um <laughs> And I don't feel like I see a lot of other bands communicating a message like that. Like I'll hear it, like you will hear it in like hip hop and stuff like right. that, or like other music that is trying to like communicate like we're getting fucked here. Yeah. Like we're getting the short end of a stick in a big fucking way. Like this is what this feels like, yeah. you know? And, and, and I, in some way, I guess, burning is ultimately trying to achieve the same thing.
tell me about your most recent work. I mean, burning has kind of a tendency to be, you know, you write so much music, you work on it in your studio at home. Um, it's, it slowly kind of comes out to band practices, then to shows, eventually then tracked and recorded, mixed, and those are all distinct phases that, you know, you showed me basically, you said, you said, I think you said, you said four albums yeah. are kind of finished. Or, or <clears throat> there's, there's two albums that are n nearly finished. Um, they're like 95% there. That that last five percent though is uh, that's a trick. It's it, it's it's a big five yeah, percent. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really big five percent because yeah. it's polishing and, and my, I get really in my head about yeah. about that. And it like I was explaining to you a few weeks ago. Um, I I don't feel like I have time. Yeah. Like I don't like I struggle with like a full time job and you know our life and yeah. you know like us having a social life and. Yeah. And also, like working on leather apparel and stuff like that. Like I, I. It's not my only hobby, right. and it's not my only like interest. Yeah. Um, as much as I do love it, um, and also like studying other music. That's a big part of what I do. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm, like it might seem like, I'm doing something absolutely insane when I'm sitting around like listening to. Music that I w you wouldn't expect me to listen to, but like I'm. I'm not doing it to be, you know, iconoclastic or something like that. Yeah. Like, like Olivia, a good friend of ours, used to give me shit all the time. Like when she would walk past my room, she'd be like, "It's either White House or Ar Ariana Grande." I yeah. d d can't make sense yeah. of your, but yeah. it, it's I'm not doing it like to yeah. you know what I mean. Like I like I'm I'm literally just processing and absorbing like techniques and and chord progressions and 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 and. In mood mm -hmm. and like the subtle things that like you know like music is such a wild kind of like amorphous way of communicating and it, it you you can just you can communicate so many hyper specific emotions that you can't with the English language that and that's what I'm really drawn to like I'm really 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 drawn to communicating these like razor sharp precise emotions that are so abstract and so unobtainable in in our language system yeah. that I think when I'm listening to other music, that's exactly what I'm seeking out yeah. is, is I'm looking for like really weird, truly weird, the other, yeah. the, the weirding moods, you know, like the, the very ethereal plane, like touching, touching the other side kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it when I can hear that in, in other in other musicians and other bands. Like I love it. I love it when I can hear that somebody has like touched the other. You know, like really poked through that membrane. Like that's why like band bandy kind of bands don't really appeal to me because mm -hmm. like I can hear that they're trying to impress their friends or play for their friends or whatever. And that's great. Do your thing. But like I, I want to hear and I want to experience poking through that membrane, yeah. you know? Like, I I find that, like, fundamentally um, required yeah. in, my, in my mind. Yeah. Do you find that that's less common in modern music or in our, in our, in our era, in our... Not necessarily. It's just harder to find. Yeah. It's just a lot harder to find. Um, I've listened to some previous episodes of your podcast where you've talked to people about that too. Like I heard you and um, Mike Connolly talking about like why isn't this genocide organ prurient collab like a bigger deal? And that's a great question. Like why aren't like why isn't that like in my feed constantly? Right. You'd think like based on the algorithm of shit I love, which is just all weird fashion, avant-garde fashion shit, and like extreme fringe music, that that would be in in there but it's not right. and it's it's because i think like advertising music advertising art is just it's it's a lot more difficult than it's ever been yeah. um and that shouldn't discourage anybody i think like i, I want to put wind in people's sails here's a great example and this I, I i could i could preach this all day long 
Uh, there's a new album 20, of this year uh, by a band called Pile, mm -hmm. um, originally from Boston, um, called All Fiction. And it, it is a fucking 10 out of 10 masterpiece. It's an absolute fucking masterpiece. Um, it's my favorite album of the year, hands down. There's another really good album by a band called They Are Gutting a Body of Water. It's called S, um, which is more of like a grungy shoegaze, Gen Z kind of thing that like has a level of like distrust for the world that I really relate to mm -hmm. and love. Um, you know, it's got that like kind of like fucking slouchy Kurt Cobain kind of energy that I'm like, yeah. Like you, yeah. you see it, yeah. like it's yes. Yeah. Um, but no, Pyle's Pyle's all fiction album is so intimidating to me. Like it, it, it is so good. But that is one of those albums that I was talking about where you feel like the the membrane has been poked. Mm -hmm. Like the the other side has been seen, yeah. and it sees you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a wild ethereal. It it really. It really goes there. Cool. And I love it. And you you should check it out. I Anybody will. who's listening to this. Do you feel like there is a space for art and bands and people and ideas and and energy like this in our current culture, whether it be pop culture, sub pop culture, sub you know, whatever? Do you feel like it's I mean Absolutely do. Yeah? Yeah, just because, like, I mean, the shows that we've played, like, like, lately, it hasn't been for the longest time. It was, like, you would see the same familiar people. Like, even up to, until, like, pre-quarantine style bullshit, like, we saw the same faces of friends and chosen family that we love and adore. And that seemed to just date back to you know, even when we first started our band. Um, and that's great, whatever, but it's almost like post, post quarantine, post pandemic. Um, I, we don't see those people anymore at all. Like none of them, virtually none. Yeah. And it, it's now it's all these like Gen Z kids. And this is what answers your question. Those kids flip the fuck out. Like we played this show um, a few months ago with Hyde from Chicago, and kids were like doing backflips and shit off of tables. It was like, like it was fucking wild. It was like a, just this like very feral energy, and I know exactly why. And like, yeah. I think there's something about that. Like these like younger kids that are like seeing like a really like visceral, like we're not we're not wasting your time. We're not lying to you. We're not yeah. pulling your chain. We're, we're just being honest. We're being yeah. brutal about it. And we're like upfront and queer and honest and you uh, whatever, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Like we're just, we're here. Yeah. Like we're not, we're on your team. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. We're not, we're, we're not fighting against you. We're, we're fighting with you. Yeah. And I think those kids are so fucking receptive to that and like so stoked on that. Okay, like, that's good. Maybe I'm just old. I mean, maybe I'm really old and I don't <coughs> know those kids or I don't see those kids, but I just have sort of the impression that there's like a malaise and like a, Not a at disengagement. All. Not at all. It's there. It's just like, I mean, I'm sure that Gen X and older people, I mean, I'm kind of on the cusp of Gen X, but like I'm sure that they said the same thing about us. Yeah. And they didn't know where to find those warehouse spaces. Right. They didn't know where those basements were, you know, like booking like, you know, noise shows and fucking festivals and whatever and like booking tours and stuff like just wouldn't whew, like yeah. right, right. For over, sure. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's real underground. Right. Exactly. Do you have hope for the youth? I do. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about, all, I, I, I try to pay attention to um, what type of mis 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 misinformation exists on, online. And I am a little bit concerned about the way it, it's like the Andrew Tate kind of stuff that's mm -hmm. like connecting with younger men is really spooky. Um, there's a few different influencers that are like trying to do very similar things with uh, younger women and, and I 
and it, 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 it's a very like pick me kind of like not like other girls right, right, sort right, of vibe right, right, right. and it, it sucks yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it, it is promoting this far more extreme version of conservative ideals than you and I ever grew up with right. you know like yeah. it's <clears throat> and like yeah I don't know I, I am spooked by it because it, it, it is so reactionary and it, it is so contrarian and just you can see like the vitriol and the the venom yeah. that's in it like there's just so much so much anger yeah. and it's really unfortunate because you know here we are in the United States where things aren't great but ultimately pretty fucking cozy compared to a lot of other parts of the world and people are like just up in arms and it's not that I don't ha I have plenty of empathy for people that are financially struggling, et, et cetera, it's, you know, health problems, blah, blah, blah. But like, I don't know if <coughs> all of those like concerns, that discomfort, that irritability is worth upending democracy for, right. you know? And, and I, there's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of people right now that are very comfortable with that idea. Mm -hmm. Do you see any movement or energy against that within the youth or, or, or wherever in, in subculture, counterculture, underground culture, you know, the anger against that crackdown, against <clears throat> that conservatism, I mean, queer energy that's, you know, directed and, and organized and powerful, or maybe not organized and powerful, but I mean. The left has a, a weird problem um, where it tends to fight itself until like the bitter end, until shit really, really, really hits the fan and it's almost too late. Um, I mean, you, you and I, have, we've, we've seen this, like you've seen it too, where it's just like <clears throat> people will die on anthills within the left yeah. um, over these like kind of, I, I don't know, um, They'll split hairs until the fucking day is long, yeah. and it's it's insane to me. Like, and I remember feeling that even years ago, like around the, like 2016, where I was freaking out, being like, "This reality TV show asshole that has the worst fucking bronzer," you know what I mean? Like weird fake tan, this awkward motherfucker that is clearly full of shit is about to be like a, a viable candidate for one of our political parties um, on a national big, I, I was like, this is real. This is actually happening. And I, you know, like would go on social media or whatever and people are splitting hairs over psycho shit that I right. would just be like, this can wait. Right. This can wait. Like, sure, it, it, it would be great to dissect it. And I'm sure that, you know, it's being dissected currently at Berkeley, and right. that's awesome. Right. Good for you. Yeah. But if this is what you're preoccupied with, then we have a problem. Right. Like, I feel like the strength of asking a lot of questions is also the weakness of the side is that you're preoccupied with so many other things, and you got the right moving mindlessly in one direction. Yeah. It's a force. Yeah. Totally. They are in lockstep. The right is just, they, they have a superpower where they are so fucking in lockstep. And they don't sit there and like eat each other. Right. I mean, yeah, they kind of are now a little bit with some of the stuff that's going on, especially in Congress. Right. But like, they're really, really good at a unified right. message in a, in, a, in a unified media ecosphere. Like, we don't have that. We don't have Fox News. We don't have an equivalent to that. Right. And that makes it very, very difficult for us. Um, and it also makes, makes it difficult that like, you know, the left does have this like, big sphere of inclusion, which it, I, I love and we all adore. Like, that's one of our strengths. But at the same time, it's also kind of one of our weaknesses in the sense that it's very hard to mobilize.
tell me about the next album that will come out. <clears throat> that's the <clears throat> that's the folk album. <laughs> you called it a folk album for me, and I was like, "This is not a folk album in any way." This. Why I do you mean, call it a folk album. I when you listen to it in whole, um, I think it's a folk album. It has like, some hammer dulcimer on it, like <laughs> mixed into all the other crazy shit. That doesn't really make it a folk album. Though. Sure. Okay, it, well, I haven't heard the album yet, but. It's your take on a folk album. <laughs> it's certainly, it yeah. It's, it's folky. It's folkier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that you, I mean, you're a very open person when it comes to music and your musical tastes, but folk music and that kind of thing is one thing you've always just shit on. And every, like, in, every, <laughs> in every way, like anything, anything like slightly in that direction, you've always been like, ugh. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, sure. <laughs> I don't know if I can really, but, um, Okay, so so that one, what I heard from it was just really beautiful and really more melodic. I mean, you, you were singing on it. Right. Um, well, I'm going to continue to call it a folk album. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, I think it has, like, a very, like... That is the most ethereal thing I've ever made. And, it's, and that's by design. Um, I wanted to make something that was very angelic. That, And the unfortunate... The unfortunate truth of that album is, um, is that every song is about suicide, mm. suicidal ide ideology. You know, it's through and through, front to back. Like there isn't it, and I and I wanted to really communicate. Again, like poking the membrane, like getting through there and and seeing the unseen kind of shit. You know, like it. it I, f I felt like a ghost in my own home mm -hmm. during the time that that was made. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's difficult to finish uh, is because when I listen to it, I'm still, a, you know, I, I'm getting secondhand absorption of, of, of that time period. Um, and I, that doesn't mean I don't want to finish it. I do. Um, this is a very, very depressing album, yeah. you know? by nature. albums yourself and you really you know from start to finish I mean of course you, you track the, the acoustic stuff in a studio but I mean you're really hands-on to the end would you ever consider giving up an album at some point to be mixed I don't know to be finished I mean to an en like an engineer who could maybe just have some different eyes and ears on it and then just kind of like because one of our albums on um... We <laughs> you, you, you don't like the idea, or it's, it's not possible? Have, <laughs> have you talked about this before? I, I don't need to. <laughs> I mean, the, the two of you have talked about this before. We've spoken about stuff, but I I know yeah. Sadie well enough to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like one of the two albums that's like really really close to being finished. Um, we recorded the drums in St. Paul at a studio, and um actually ended up paying the engineer uh, quite a few months later to mix those for us. Because um, mixing that many drum mics is, you know, it's just, it, it's a lot. Yeah, it's, you know, all the phase issues, all the this and that, whatever, on um, the bleed issues. And eventually I just kind of was like, fuck it. Like, let's just, let's just pay this guy. He knows what he's doing to do it. It's not that he did a bad job. He did a great job. Yeah. Um, Incredibly competent engineer, awesome guy. I'd recommend him to anybody. But at the same time, 
I'm so weirdly yeah. picky about things that when he handed me a left and right stereo image of the drums, I was like, fuck, I don't have any control over this anymore. Yeah, yeah. So the answer ultimately is no. Hmm. More technical question. What What is your vocal, I mean, is vocal training, vocal processing, vocal work? What is that like nowadays on a, you know, I heard you were singing on this album and, and, and how has that changed or what are you doing these days with vocals? Pre and post production, you know? Vocals are weird I, and there's a handful of different things. Like the track you heard is something I don't normally ever do. Um, in that track, I was I was singing to a seventh. A seventh. I was singing to a seventh harmony, that was. Um. A formant, uh, filter, like a, um. So that's a that's a strange thing to do because you kind of have to have like one headphone thing on and one off so mm -hmm. you, can, you can hear what you're doing but then you can hear what the track is doing mm -hmm. um so that took a few a few runs to to nail just because i i needed to sing up to the seventh to get it to fall to the tonic mm -hmm. and uh, yeah whatever um but then like for live stuff like i do this really really weird thing i don't know anybody else who does this um where i set um I set an auto tune to an A sharp, which is the key center of most of our older songs from the period of time that we're still playing music from. Mm -hmm. um, and that locks in any um, stable pitch to A sharp. Mm -hmm. But the, pro the thing is, and the reason why this is so strange, and is because I'm I'm, I'm screaming. Yeah. And when you're when you're screaming, like you're using vocal fry. And you're using a lot of this like white noise. Yeah. Um, white noise doesn't lock right. to an auto tune, yeah. so it creates this like kind of like scrambled sort yeah. of sound. And I've had I've had quite a few people be like, "What is the effect that you're using?" And I'm just abusing an yeah. auto tune yeah. that is not. It's not auto tuning to um, a specific scale yeah. or, you know, like it's it, there's no. I, I'm not setting a scale. So it's completely chromatic. It's just the somehow it knows that the root note is A sharp. Um, so it's an A sharp chromatic and it, it freaks out and, and just does this weird garbly kind of thing. Sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes the, the scream cuts right through. Right. It, it depends on how much um, clear tonality, is com clear pitch is coming through. It yeah. depends on the vocal line. Um, so a lot of times it's not even activated because I'm just screaming. Right, right. Um, but then if I do something quieter, it'll try to lock it in. Yeah. Do you yeah. do the same thing on recordings? No, that's that's kind of just real. Uh, that's yeah. my live thing. Do you do a lot of post production on vocals well, and recordings in terms of pitch? No. Things like that. No. Not with pitch. With um, post production stuff for vocals, it's just kind of your standard like convolution reverbs. Um, mm -hmm delays you know like <clears throat> maybe like blending in like a ring mod but like all my all my stuff is like multi 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 layered where it's you know multi band compressors on one copy of the vocal track um different drives different types of drives whether that's you know like rectified distortions or wave holding distortion or whatever and like that'll be a thing and then on another track will be like you know time-based effects like delay and 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 reverbs and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and then any like any of the more weird kind of synth synth sort of vocal effects will will be in there too if if there are any yeah. um and sometimes i'll fuck with pitch a little bit but okay. it, yeah it, i don't know it just all depends depends yeah. on the track <sighs>
Adam, I, um, I apologize. I haven't really been talking to you or asking you questions I, 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 <laughs> so far. I, this, but um, I can't speak much about the, the beginning of burning. So I, yeah. I, well, tell me about you know your place in the band and what you do in the band, and also your background. I mean, you're you're you played in black metal bands prior yeah. to, and you still do, and you play. Well, just tell me. Just tell me what you do before I surmise. Wow. At the moment, I'm only working with Burning. Okay. So, I mean, that's, I, I mean, I, you know, I came from a black metal background. You know, I, I grew up, you know, I, I remember going to Medusa. I remember going to the church. I remember these places. But, I, you know, I'm a bit younger, so it's a little more like I wasn't putting the shows together, yeah. booking the shows, playing the shows. But I was there. Yeah. And then slowly after that, starting to book more shows. You know, book, I book Burning prior to a lot of things. Yeah. You know, I still book Burning shows. Yeah. But, uh, you know, right now I'm playing baritone guitar, so I'm kind of guitar and or bass if yeah. needed because of my pedal board and what I can do with sub octave pedal. It's just uh, right now I, I want to be working on newer stuff, which I, I think would be possibly incorporate more kind of just like ambient weird guitar stuff mm -hmm. like with some of what I have on the pedal board. But you were playing when I, sh when I, when I saw you guys, a couple, you know, last week or a couple weeks ago. You were playing your guitar, but like a bass, right? I mean, you were playing bass lines, and it sounded like a bass. Yeah, no, yeah, it's a, it's a MXR sub submachine. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I don't know, but that at this point, kind of through like, a baritone guitar. Through a baritone guitar, so I mean, it, it it does emulate a bass very well. I think it sounds great. Yeah, but you know, I I definitely want to start working on more stuff, putting more of like stuff I'm working on into burning tracks. Yeah. It makes sense more of what it what it speaks for mm -hmm. me to be in the band, to be in the project because it's because like, I get that. Like I get liminality, I get the fact that like this is not a space most people inherit. Yeah. They they, they just kind of are you know, a lot of people don't see it. They just move right over it because it's easy to miss. Right. Why would someone want to be here? Right. No one wants to be in the space. Right. <laughs> but sometimes you get really good stuff. You know, you get projects like burning out of places like that. Right. But that's something where I felt very strongly connection to burning in terms of that. Is that it's 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 about it's about pain. It's about shared pain. It's about having. You know, you've smelled the shit. People, I, I feel like a lot of people in the band have, you know, you, you understand that, and I feel like we bring that to the stage. And I know for a long time, and most people would say that Burning's a live band. Like, you really don't understand what Burning is until you see it live. Right. Sure, like, sonically, on an, on an album, on, on MP3, whatever, it sounds great, but you don't get to see it. Yeah. How is that being so close to that? I mean... You guys are partners. You guys are lovers, um, and you're so you feel have this really personal connection to you know this music. But this music is ultimately coming from Sadie's you know life, history, background, current, um, and you no know, as, as someone who both cares for her deeply and is so close to her, but also you know your own person. And you're not you haven't been in the band as long. How how has it been for you to just kind of be in this? in this world emotionally? Fine. I, I'm willing to move through this and do, like I do want to add stuff of my own, but I'm not in any way looking to take over a band or do anything like that. Like I'm, I'm following with this project mm -hmm. and I'm willing to give my own, whatever I bring to the stage, whatever I bring to music to this project because I, I want it. I believe in it. I think it makes sense to me. I don't know if it makes sense to anyone else, but it doesn't really matter yeah. because it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> so that's <laughs> kind of just how, how it is. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to keep it what it is. I like the intensity. I like the extremity. And I don't want it to change. I like the sexual energy, the violence, the everything, the depression, the sadness. And, you know, when I go on stage, it's not like I'm... I'm most people are just like, yeah, you had a fun show. I'm like, you know what? No, yeah. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. And like, it wasn't fun. It wasn't really super fun for me, but it was a good show, and that brought me some sort of semblance of something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, you know, 
kind of maybe relating to your say to your attract used to mention your attraction to music that really touches something else and goes beyond a lot of times that music isn't fun at all no and not. i and i don't think burning is fun i mean it's probably not, <laughs> it's definitely it, not fun. it used to be maybe somewhat fun you know in the old days in the early days when we were just kind of right raging yeah but i totally relate to that you know and i can on, on my own level with with music that i've worked on that sometimes it's just not fun even if it's even if i'm very proud of, or it, it, it was effective it did what it, i wanted it to do it's just not fun it doesn't feel good right um but well, it's, music doesn't have to be fun huh? no no There's but i mean but even, even just positive you know even like you know if we're performing you know like um sometimes it doesn't feel that way i mean that's a question i've been asking a couple people you know recently on the podcast um is that you know does contact with industrial culture this type of music this despair in music does it help you or does it exacerbate your feelings you it know? definitely helps yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But i feel like this type of music particularly brings out certain people like you don't get here just because you got here you, right. you went through hell right. <laughs> and i feel like those are the people that make it more worth it to me because it makes sense that i don't have to explain everything to them yeah. before like meeting them i'm like you're already here right We're, we've already moved past so much right like i'm like you, you i can see it on you right like this person hurts yeah and that's fine like, yeah they may not hurt in the same way i do yeah but it's it's a shared it's a shared pain right yeah and that is the power of music and that's i mean as corny as that sounds that is what it's there for like you said, these things that language can't, can never communicate. Right. What are the plans for Burning in terms of, you know, releasing these albums? And are there plans to play more shows nationally or expose the band or yourselves to a wider audience and try to chase that at all or, 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 or follow that, or, you know? I, don't know I, I understand. I, to, I totally respect your, your your way of working, but I really, really want. I really hope that this music really reaches the people it's supposed to reach. I understand that. Um, I mean, we'll see. I don't know. Like I said, I think the clock is ticking. Um, I think that <clears throat> that clock is. I don't know. We'll determine everything, you know, like whether our marriage will be seen as legal, whether my medical shit will be legal. Like, right. I don't I have a lot of trust in, in that at the moment. Yeah. Um, and not to sound defeatist, I just right. yeah. don't. And <clears throat> um, I don't think that affords me a lot of time right. to consider like do we do we like you know play play to the game do we right, you know what I mean like right, participate right. in that in that world in the, in the way that some of our friends get to do like right. I don't um, so I don't really think about it in those terms um, not to say that I haven't because I certainly have right. and if we would have done it <clears throat> properly and like really really tried we should have done that years ago you know but at the same time it wouldn't have made any sense like had we done that years ago when it was just like me Mike and Tanner right like, um so yeah I don't know um I on one hand I I do want to tell my story before my story is not able to be told um, that's a very real thing uh, so I'd, yeah I'd love to finish these albums and just get them out there because <clears throat> I don't think the internet is ever going to die um, despite some people's best wishes um, I don't think that queer culture will ever be fully erased like we're you can't put the toothpaste back in the bottle with with this, with right. the internet, with modern technology, you right. just, you can't. Right. Um, 
and I would like to have I'd like to have this out there for the world uh, in that in that regard. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll we'll see. I mean, I'd love it. I'd love that luxury of another four years of not freaking out constantly yeah. and and worrying that, you know, like, what are we going to do? Right. Like, a, a brown man and a trans man person, like, we're, it, it just feels like we're fucked. Right. What would be something, a message, you know, in words that you would give to someone listening or watching who might also be feeling the same way or going through what you went through or, you know, or at the beginning stages of that journey? Oh, no. Um, <clears throat> I think it's critically important to, to do what you're going to do to come out, to be who you are and, and be honest. Um, I, that's irreplaceable. Um, and I know that, you know, populism... Uh, sp specifically of the the right wing variety is kind of in vogue right now, but fuck it, like do you and honestly do you? Because um, there's a lot of there's power in numbers, right. um, and I think that younger people see that. I think that Gen Z gets it. Um, I think a lot of the, <clears throat> like, I love how, like, secular our culture is becoming. Like, I think it's great. I think it's one of the best things that's ever happened in this country is the growth of secularism. I think it's wonderful. Um, there's a lot of people that can't handle, like we were saying earlier, ambiguity and chaos. Um, but, I mean, those are kind of universal principles of everything that we know about everything. Mm -hmm. And I love, there's a lot of younger people that are just like, yeah, sick, awesome. That's just part of life. I don't need everything to be boiled down to this brutally simple knucklehead reduction. Yeah, You know, like there are a lot of people that are very comfortable with ambiguity and chaos yeah. that are younger. And I love it, that, that, that brings me hope. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I do hope that I know this episode is of your podcast is probably not going to resonate with a lot of the people that are deep into the, like kind of the culture of like the, the material culture of, of noise music and stuff. I but I, I, if anything, I, I hope that they give this a listen and they're like, okay, this, this is, you know, it, it's related to the genre. I mean, thro Throbbing Gristle is yeah. all I need to say there. Yeah, you know, like, of course. Um, but also, I don't know, I hope this reaches your, your the, the queer, queer demographic that does listen to your podcast. And, and the non-queer demographic. I mean, what, they need to hear this too. I think more. Sure. More so. I mean, um, Adam, is there anything you would add to people, that, a, a message that you want people to take to heart, you know, in, in this regard? I just feel that if, if you live in the black and white, this isn't for you. Like, this is the gray. Yeah. This is, this is, you can be liminal, you can be, you can be all kinds of things, but no one can put you in a box and tell you that this is who you are. And that's, that's how it is, and I'm sure a lot of people relate with that. I know people listening to noise music, harsh, any sort of extreme music understand that because they don't just listen to that because they're feeling great. Right. And I feel like that's a big part of this is the fact that people need to be able to navigate that grade and say, you, you need to make your mind up for yourself and align yourself with people that make sense. Like, I don't, I wasn't just 
awarded a family. I built mine. Yeah. So that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, I love you guys, and thank you so much for talking with me about this. Um, Burning is one of the best bands of all time, I believe, and you will know them soon enough. Thank you. Anything else you want to add? Nope. Love you, Oscar, so much. You're one of my best friends and one of my favorite people I've ever known. Thank all right. You, Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for tuning into this episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast with Burning. After this interview, we hung out with the camera in Sadie and Adam's apartment, where Sadie showed me the leather garments and bondage gear she's been working on. They both shared their top five records of all time and more. That's in the bonus extended segment of the interview that you can watch when you support White Centipede Noise Podcast for just five euros a month. Next week, I'll be premiering a new series called Noise Cribs on Patreon. The first episode is with Grant Richardson of Nod and Hex Audio Labs. To check out that and much more exclusive content, go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise your support via patreon not only gets you exclusive content and involvement in white centipede noise podcast but it's also what makes the public episodes of the podcast available for everyone thanks to all patreon supporters shout out to everyone active on the maniac circle discord server and an extra special thanks to the heavy sponsors three cd white centipede noise podcast compilation coming soon go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now for more info